Mark, thank you for joining me. Um, could you provide an update of what's happening at Tramia Rovers Football Club at the moment? There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes at the moment to get ready for, for, for the future. Yeah, yeah I think um, one of the things is, is clearly we're, we're in a period of massive uncertainty. And it's not just massive uncertainty as regards football. There is no football at the moment. So there's, there's a real um, desire of fans and a thirst for information from fans which I can understand that, as I say, we never take it for granted and apathy would be uh, would be the death of us. So, you know, I can understand that. But sometimes, I mean, Disraeli said that it's sometimes it, it, people wonder why you don't speak and why you do. Uh, and I said last time that you know, sometimes it's not helpful in terms of things that we're trying to do for the benefit of the club. So we're talking about a manager. I, I don't really want to talk about all the managerial candidates in, in deference to them. Um, talking about players in particular and players we want to sign and don't want to sign, etc. It's 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 not right that we should do that. I mean, the agents will be piling stuff in. The, the players will be talking to members of the family, etc. But for the club, I just don't think it's appropriate. I just don't think it's sensible for us to talk in detail about what we're doing with plans, you know, and the legal actions similar again. So it's difficult sometimes to conduct a business such as a football club, which is in the public eye relative to other businesses. And it's difficult to always get that that right in terms of the level of communication and detail that's going on. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's quite a lot going on behind the scenes, as you say. Um, what we have to do is is really in a period of uncertainty like this, I have to recognise the fact that whilst yeah we can't speak about a lot of the things we're doing, there's also a big difficulty in planning because of the uncertainty. You know, so we we again we we rely on paying gates as do all the clubs. In the in the second half, or the, basically the League One and in League Two, uh, and the fact of the matter is, whilst we rely on those paying gates, we have absolutely no idea when we're going to start playing again in front of paying gates. Um, there is, you know, an in, an indication the EFL are really driving to try and get a uh, a, a start in 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 September on September the twelfth, and I understand the reasons why they're trying to do that, um, but. It, it may not be possible or feasible. You know, we don't know <coughs> whether we're going to be paying behind closed doors to start, or that's the likely scenario. Um, the government were talking in terms of October for playing for paying gates, at least in part. So maybe it's thirty percent, is it twenty five percent? At the end of the day, we have to respect that. You know, um, health of people and COVID is is massively important, and that's the big issue that will decide when we start. And how we start between paying so we have this uncertainty that's in there um over on top of that as well there's also this indication that we're going to have a salary cap now that may be slowed down because of disagreements because of the pfa but with a salary cap it makes a big difference we don't want to be spending money on players that takes us through the salary cap and actually gets us into a position whereby we lose points so you're looking at that you're looking at the fact that players are coming out of contract came out of contract and the last payment they got was in July. So suddenly they're in a marketplace where they haven't got a job. And for the first time, they're not getting paid. Because these are the people who were paid in full, don't forget, um, right the way through the COVID period. So, you know, they're in a position of uncertainty. And actually the price at which players will sign, therefore, becomes an issue. And we don't want to be paying too much for players. And, you know, on top of that, there's a question of a rescue package. Is that going to happen? Um, or is that just pulling forward monies from the future, which means it's not really a rescue package as such. It's actually putting off some of the problems that you're going to be getting. Um, I said the EFL were pushing for a, a, um, a start on the 12th of September. I mean, I, I took part about a week ago, two weeks ago, on, on a conference call um, with, with clubs. And it's what I would call in my career, I'd call it a figure-free universe. There was no indication of, of you know, as all those things I've been talking about. When are we going to have paying gates? When are we going to start? Is there going to be a salary management cap protocol? Is there not going to be? There was nothing that was mentioned. So it's almost impossible to plan against that particular scenario. And that causes difficulties because, you know, as a consequence of this, there's no obvious action to fans. And there's no obvious action by most clubs, I would say, because I think that, you know, 22 clubs out of the clubs in Leagues 1 and 2 uh, have not actually signed any players. So everybody is sort of in the same boat. We keep our ear to the ground and, you know, our, you know, we are looking at what other clubs are doing as well. So that is a difficulty that we have to deal with. It's something extra 
that COVID's brought in terms of planning you know, what the squad will look like for next season. No news doesn't necessarily mean um, a lack of action, does it? You know, as as we've referred to, you know, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, both on the football pitch and off the football pitch, to make sure this football club's in the most stable position it can be during these times. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that what I want to say on this is you've got to strike a balance in, in these things. You've got to strike a balance between not throwing away, you know, the benefits of six years. I mean, this week I think it's coming up our sixth anniversary of being here at the club. But it's not thrown away the benefits of, of those six years of hard work, you know, not just by us, but by a lot of people involved in that. And and the club has got into a position whereby it's it's digested a lot of things, a lot of issues. You know, we've had relegation into the National League, three years in the National League, three and a half million of losses in the National League. I said it last time, you know, we had two we've digested two promotions and we were getting through that. We've had COVID come along, we had a pitch collapse. Not only we had COVID come along, they put us down a league. You know, so all of these things have come along and we've been able to digest them. Now, that's important to note because at the end of the day, you know, what we're, it's, it's about doing it properly from a financial perspective. What we don't want to do is to throw away the benefits of six years hard work by, you know, taking, a, taking chances in, in, in this marketplace that we have, I just described, um, in, without the knowledge of what the implications of that are. And so it's a balance between not throwing that away, but also being agile and ready to respond when when it gets to the point that you can sign players. I'm not saying we won't sign players in, in the very near future because at the end of the day, whilst our market intelligence tells us that you know what you've seen is that clubs haven't been signing players, except for those clubs that they can spend the money as they want to spend it, um, who, who think they can sort of jump the gun, I think, in terms of um, getting ahead of the salary management cap uh, protocol. Um, but we've, we've had our targets. We've always had our targets. When Mickey was here, we been talking about our targets and we've refined, we've refined them as Jacko's come on board. So, you know, is there action? Well, hang on a minute. Yes, there has been action. There is action. We had to find a new manager. We found the new manager. And it's very important as, as an ex-player, I know that when you're talking to a club about um, coming to sign for a club, you need to talk to the man who's going to play you or not play you, who's going to be responsible for the way you play and the opportunities you're going to have, etc. So we needed to have a manager. And, uh, and you know, you, you don't get a manager... Just on Jacko happens to be the internal candidate, but it isn't just like an easy choice, as Jacko will tell you. You know, we, we had seven hours of, of, of interview to understand how he was going to approach the job, how he was going to change from an assistant manager into a manager, all those aspects, and a lot more besides. So, you know, in addition to that, we were looking at quality candidates and we were looking at, we were desktoping the CVs, etc., to understand and researching people. Um, by way of due diligence, etc. So there was two weeks solid work just just getting the manager in place, and then on top of that, the week after that, last week and, and, and the week before that, um, we were talking about putting a, a team in place with, with you know with Jekyll, what which is necessary. So you know with that we we've signed Ian Dawes, who's uh, as the assistant manager. Again, good guy, understands the club, knows, got a great track record, great reputation when we due diligence him. Hodgie, who, whom you all know, um, um, is fantastic as a sports scientist, steps up to head of medical and sports science. Uh, and, and Maddie's come in as a, from the academy as our, as our first team physio. So, you know, a great continuity in the club, massively important. And again, you're seeing that coming through. So we build on what's gone before. We don't just throw it out. Uh, out a new goalkeeping coach we, we, we've uh, agreed to. Uh, and also on top of that, you know, I'm just looking here at the list of list of employees, etc. You know, we, we, we have an analyst coming in as well. So there's been a massive amount of work in sort of building that. But the key point as well is that we have been constantly, and it's a daily, daily review of where we are with our targets, with the people that we're talking to, etc. And this goes on, and this goes on and on day by day. Um, so, you know, yeah, a lot, a lot of things... Um, have uh, continued and, and uh, you know, and lots more will do that. But that's really the focus on just the playing area. Talking away from the, the playing area, a lot of community initiatives have been going on. Um, work that you must be very proud of. I, I think it, I think it's work that you know, the fans should be proud of and, and the club should be proud of. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's been a massive feature. It, it, what's quite interesting is you see players who have left us and they've talked about the club. And they talk about the club in terms of yeah, you know, it's a great club and and, and it's and it's really rooted and connected with its community, and and that, that's just a strong message. You know, I, I'll be saying it again, um, but you know what we've done is yeah, yeah, we've done things like 
you know, we, we sorted the pitch out and everybody sort of just forgotten about that but you know that's done uh, but we continue to keep the momentum off the park on all the projects that we were trying to to, to deal with the 3g at the campus and, and the rec center and this is done with reduced staffing so apologies for those people when they were trying to sign for tickets etc but we have reduced staffing as part of the furloughing um and you know the work the work of, of these these guys uh, and, and, and ladies has been complicated by the overlay of, of of covid so we've had to be planning things such as um you know, return to play what the protocols are returning to play how we plan in the stadium itself how we keep everybody safe etc uh, and rightly so and also return to training we've, we've got protocols imposed by you know the efl and and, and, and the medics and the medics so we've been planning all of that and working through all of that to get the place safe for us to start again um and keeping the fans engaged um as you say a massive thing for me and for Nikki, in terms of what COVID has meant, there's been this engagement with the fans because um, it's difficult when there isn't, you know, there isn't the core element of that engagement matches on a Saturday and on a Tuesday, etc. But actually, they've been great. You know, we, we've um, we've done our best in terms of things. You know, we're looking at changing church, shirt manufacturer or our options on that at least, whether it's Puma or not. Uh, we've got the fan design competition. We've had over 200 entries, and this evening. Uh, we will be going through them to produce a shortlist, which will then go out to fans to vote on. You know, again, it's about engagement, but it, that was listening to fans when I was having a bit of fun regarding the um, the, the first team shirts and sending out some um, hints and prompts, which people <laughs> were very disappointed when the final result came out. So I thought I better step up the grade here. But it was the, the, the real thing there was the engagement of the fans who actually wanted to uh, you know, to have a say in. in, in the shirt look like and like yourself uh so that's why i thought well maybe we put this competition in place and that's one of the things that you know we, we, we've been working to um one of the biggest things is is of course uh i think we're now up to about twenty five thousand pounds for the community tickets collected from fans and supporters uh and about uh twenty three thousand i think it is for the community food that we've done uh, and, and provided so you know there you're talking of nearly fifty thousand pounds that the fans of this club have contributed to the community and on top of that you know um one of the things i said with the efl problems that we had was the best way of, of the best work form of revenge was living well and the fans have responded to that you know they've come in and tried to make Princeton park um and they've been tidying up we've had i think it's uh, 50 60 people who've come around regularly uh, to help and that's on top of on top of what trosk and the trust have been doing in terms of you know their work on, on making the place you know something fit for the swa um but in addition to that it's all this sort of Prenton park you know fortress Prenton park and, and project Prenton park so it's looking after our ground and using the time to get it into a position that it, you know it, it's fit for the for the swa going forwards um, so, you know, we've had tremendous involvement from the fans and, and uh, that's been something that really makes all of this hassle uh, worthwhile because at the end of the day is, is what this is, is all about. Um, hopefully, uh, in terms of uh, season tickets, for example, great response from the fans for that. And, and yeah, I, I took the decision the other day that... Um, the season ticket deadline, for example, we're just going to drop that. We're not going to have a deadline because I think it's unfair on those of our fans who perhaps relate to the deadline and, and find it's a way of, of saving money and can't afford it as easily as the other fans who've been great and have, have, have contributed um, and, and bought their season tickets. So um, what we don't want to do is to force people by dint of putting a deadline in place. Uh, when The reality is nobody can tell me when we allow those people to come into the ground and, and watch a game of football back at Prenton Park. So that uncertainty exists. So <clears throat> it hasn't been announced yet, but we will do that. We will take away the season ticket deadline. We may have to reinstate some kind of deadline once we understand what the protocols are around um, how many fans we can let into the ground, because there's no sense in selling more season tickets than we could than we could allow people into the ground. And the indications are at this point in time, we're not at that point. Um, but that again would just be a furnace issue. That there's no point in selling season tickets when you know, people can't come and watch the game. So that that's one of the things that will we'll start to happen. Um, but you know, the main 
focus is, is return to play and, and, and what all that entails from planning the, the way in which we can you know, have people safely in the ground, uh, how the players can safely can return to training, how they can play pre-season games. I think one of the things that it should be stated here is that despite all the uncertainty uh, and not knowing when we could um, come back and return to play, it, we, we took the players off, off furlough because uh, we didn't want to be uh, blindsided and have not having our guys fit should we start on September the 12th. So there's a cost inherent in that and doing that, but we've done that and they returned to training today. They were training, training small groups, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, we're doing everything that we can, I think. Um, and hopefully the next few weeks will we'll bring a little bit more certainty into, into the position. But again, there's no guarantee of that, as we've seen with the outbreaks and the localised outbreaks that are around the place. You know, COVID is still with us and still is a, you know, a danger to a, a lot of people. So um, that, that really is um, you know, what we're expecting to see in the next few weeks. Finally, the, the last point I just want to make is, that, you know, trust us. You know, the, the football club is moving in the right direction. It's all about trust now, isn't it? It is, you know, uh, it goes back to the to the motto where there's faith, there's the, you know, there's light and strength. And um, you know, I, I don't like to ask people to trust me because I'd rather they'd see, you know, what we do. Um, but the thing I would say is, just, trust us in the sense that if we're silent, there's nothing to say particularly. Um, and you know, trust us in the sense that if, if even if you don't hear from us, you know, we are working hard. Um, and sometimes it's best to be silent on things. We are working hard on all of the issues around the club, uh, and, and the essence for us here is to balance you know, the long term uh, against the short term. And uh, you know that's what we'll continue to do. And I think that's what the fans of Tranmere Rovers want us to do. Um, and you know, we, as I say, when, when the, the good thing about this and the good thing about COVID, if there is a good thing about COVID, is we've seen the strength of the club once again. Like, you know, you, you said to me. You know, one of the positives is is the uh, is the response of the fan base, and you know, that is absolutely it. Because you know, I'll say it again and again and again because it's true. And you know, the fans are the club. So the, you know, if if the fans are the club and the fan base are responding in this way, then the club's responding in the right way.